I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, just to let everybody know, um, first time speaking at RubyConf, first time speaking in general. So thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, so this is Rubik's Cube. Uh, my name is Stafford Brunk. Um, you can find me around the internet uh, under the handle wingrunner21. Uh, I work as a full stack software engineer at Guild Education in Denver, Colorado. Um, we're a startup that's striving to help working adults go back to school in an affordable manner. Um, what we don't do, however, is pretty much anything to do with Rubik's Cubes. Uh, so why? Why did I do this project? Um, so probably about a year ago, uh, my wife and I were having dinner with our neighbors um, and their uh, middle school aged daughter came over and she was super amped about uh, a Rubik's Cube solving robot that she'd seen at a museum exhibit. Um, she'd been working on learning how to solve cubes uh, herself for the past few months uh, and she was just starting to take programming classes in school so she was very interested in how this thing actually worked. Uh, so I started thinking about the problem, and I was like, well, I mean, maybe I could figure out how to build a Rubik's Cube robot uh, and sit down with her and explain the concepts and, and go over the differences between how a human approaches the, sol the problem of solving Rubik's Cubes and how a computer would do that. Uh, there was one problem, though. Uh, I was not an expert in these areas. Uh, I wasn't even an amateur. Um, I had never even attempted to solve a Rubik's Cube before. I was kind of... Uh, I had some robotics background and some design background, but I had not done anything along these uh, lines before. So uh, I was a complete junior cuber. Uh, cuber is what people in the Rubik's Cube community call themselves uh, solving cubes. Uh, so at this point, uh, you all must be thinking, can this guy even solve a Rubik's Cube? Uh, no, no, I can't. Um, but Ruby can. Uh, I'm still learning the ins and outs of solving a Rubik's Cube by hand, um, but this project has given me a lot better idea uh, around the fundamentals around the Rubik's Cube problem set, um, but has not given me some sort of magical boost in the ability to do it myself. Uh, if you'd like to follow along at all, um, all the code uh, and associated links and stuff is posted under the Rubik's Cube uh, repository under my GitHub account. Um, that Google URL just takes you to the same place. Um, yeah, so let's get going. So this is the general roadmap. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is go over some of the basics, like uh, terminology and movement notation. Um, if you're a seasoned cuber, uh, my apologies, this is going to be pretty basic for you. Um, the next step is we're going to go look at some of the strategies for solving a cube. Uh, and then finally, we'll talk about kind of what my plan is for the next steps on this project. Uh, so first up is terminology. Uh, there's pretty much three basic terms that you need to be familiar with here. A uh, face, a facelet, and a cubelet. So first up is a face. Uh, facets are pretty much the individual sides of the cube. Faces are denoted in reference to whichever face is closest to you, independent of color. Uh, in this instance, the yellow side of the cube is the one that's closest to you, so it is the front face. From there, you can see that the remaining faces on the cube, red is the right face, left <clears throat> Orange is the left face, blue is the top or upper face, green is the bottom or down face, and white is the back face. Faces are broken up into nine individual facelets. Uh, these are basically the individual colored stickers in the cube. Facelets are numbered from one to nine, starting in the upper left-hand corner and wrapping around as you go down the cube. Uh, a cubelet represents the individual colored pieces of the Rubik's Cube. So these are the cubes that make up the cube. There are 26 total cubelets in a 3 by 3 Rubik's Cube. They are broken up into three categories, corners, edges, and centers. You can see the corner cubelets highlighted here in pink. Corner cubelets are exactly that, the cubes in the eight corners of the Rubik's Cube. As each corner cubelet is the intersection of three faces, it has three possible orientations. Let's take a look at the URF corner cubelet as an example. Take a look at where the yellow, red, and blue sides meet. If you remember from our face terminology, this is the intersection of the U, R, and F faces. Thus, this is the URF corner. There are three different orientations displayed here. You can see an individual orientation is essentially a simple rotation of the cubelet. Each corner cubelet can be oriented along the same pattern to produce all possible orientations of the cube corners. So if you twist the one corner that we have twisted here and then another corner is twisted, that's another permutation of the cube. 
Um, note that while the corner cubelets themselves can be placed into these orientations, you can't necessarily reach all of these orientations through legal cube moves, meaning without actually taking the cube and rotating it yourself through normal turning of the cube. Uh, the next type of cubelet is an edge. Edge cubelets represent where two faces meet. Again, they're highlighted here in pink. There are t uh, 12 total edges on a three by three Rubik's cube. Each edge has two possible orientations. Here we can see the two different orientations of the FR edge cubelet. Like corners, a different orientation is simply a rotation of the cubelet's possible values. Also, like corners, permutations of the 12 edges on the cube equal all possible edge orientations. Finally, we have center cubelets. In a three by three cube, there are six center cubelets. As the center cubelets only ever touch one face, there's no orientation to worry about, they only have one. One of the most important things to remember about the center cubelet is that its position is essentially fixed. All corner and edge cubelets move around the centers. So the centers are the axis of rotation for each individual face of the cube. Now that we're familiar with the parts of the cube, we need to go over how you denote movements on a cube. For that, Cubers have adopted a notation of relative movement developed by math professor David Singmaster. We'll only be talking about the basic movements here. If you're interested in the more advanced cube movements, I recommend checking out ruwix.com's article on this uh, topic. Movements are defined in terms of quarter rotations in relation to one of the cube's faces. Each movement has an optional modifier that denotes the type of movement that will be performed. In this example, we'll use the front or F face as that which is being moved. A single letter denotes a clockwise quarter turn. So here you can see that the F face has gone from its original solve state to having all colors rotated by 90 degrees clockwise. There's no modifier required for this type of move. Here we can see an example of a modifier at work. F2 designates two 90 degree turns in the clockwise direction. It is possible within this notation to specify additional higher numbers, but this is rarely used since it overlaps other notations. For example, an F4 notation would be equivalent to no movement, as in you would do four quarter rotations and you're back to where you started. An F5 notation is equivalent to an F rotation. F prime denotes a quarter turn in the counterclockwise direction. You'll notice that this is the same as if you'd specified an F3 rotation. Individual face movements are chained together to create movement strings. Take, for example, the movement string here, F, R prime, U2. We start with a solved cube on the left, execute a clockwise turn of the F face, a counterclockwise turn of the R face, and two clockwise turns of the U face. The end result is shown on the far right. And I'm pretty sure that that's the correct cube orientation, but I drew those by hand in Illustrator, so forgive me if I've got some squares out of place. All right, so let's move on to actually solving the cube. So we're gonna go over three strategies here. Uh, brute force, um, what's commonly known as CFOP or layer by layer, uh, and finally, uh, Kosienda's two-phase algorithm. So why don't we just brute force the solution to this? It's a three by three cube, right? It really shouldn't take us that long. Well, there are actually 43 quintillion possible permutations of a Rubik's cube. More precisely, 43 quintillion, 252 quadrillion, 3 trillion, 700, or 274 billion, 489 million, 856,000 flat permutations. That is a huge number. Computing how to solve that many permutations would take you years, which is exactly what researchers did. <laughs> the upper and lower bounds on the number of moves that are required to solve a Rubik's cube is known as God's number. The term comes from the idea that were God to be given a scrambled Rubik's cube, he would always solve it in the most optimal way. The bounds were first thought to be roughly 17 on the lower end and 80 on the high end, meaning researchers thought it would take a minimum of 17 moves and a maximum of 80 moves uh, when they first began to research this in 1980. It wasn't until 2010, thanks to the efforts of Thomas Rokicki, Herbert Kosiemba, Morley Davidson, and John Dethridge, that the upper and lower bounds were converged into a single number. This number was reached via 35 CPU years of computing time donated by Google. So that's just how long it took them to compute that problem space. Uh, and that number is 20. All scrambled Rubik's cubes can be solved in a maximum of 20 moves for the most optimal solution. 
Researchers discovered this by computing all possible solutions to the cube and making sure that none of them required more than 20. Note that they didn't actually have to compute all 43 quadrillion different solutions in order to reach this conclusion. Due to the nature of how Rubik's cubes move, some permutations are considered symmetrical to each other. Think of it like this. If I took a Rubik's cube and held it up to you, and then I turned it over, the solution to solve that cube is exactly the same. It's just a different face is on the F face. Those are considered per, uh, symmetrical permutations. All right. So it took 35 CPU years to compute all the moves. That means we could just have a lookup table, right? It'd just be like a giant hash, and we can just hit it and go. Uh, it'd be like super fast. Well, it would take a lot of space. Even if you assumed one byte per solution string, which is completely unreasonable, it would take 43,000 petabytes just to store everything. I'm sure you've got much better things to store than Rubik's Cube movement strings, like your shiny new collection of airdropped cat pictures from RubyConf. <laughs> so, the brute force method is a no-go. Random movements would take an infeasible amount of computation time. Pre-computing all possible movements would require a ton of storage, much less how long it would take you to actually perform a lookup on a data set that size. We'll have to use other strategies to solve the cube. But first, let's ask, how do humans solve a Rubik's Cube? The answer is they break it down into smaller parts. So here's an example of a beginner strategy for solving the Rubik's Cube. Uh, it's known as the layer by layer strategy. This strategy is part of a set of strategies that fall under the CFOP genre. CFOP stands for cross, first two layers, orient, position. So basically you're starting from the top of the Rubik's Cube, solving that layer, solving the middle layer, solving the bottom layer. Uh, this genre is popular for beginners and for advanced uh, cube solving techniques. There's some speed, so, uh, speed cubing solutions that use this um, and some basic uh, computer algorithms that use this. Um, the idea, <clears throat> sorry, uh, note that uh, I'm going to go through the strategy as you would solve it as a human, but I'm not gonna go into the strategy in depth. Uh, if you'd like more information on this, again, go to rubix.com and they have a great article on uh, beginner strategy for solving the cube. So first step, uh, make a white cross at the top. Uh, you can see that the edges and the centers are also color aligned here. Uh, put the corners into position. So this is, marks the complete um, solving of the first layer. You can see that uh, the orange and the green are solved, uh, centers are still in position. Uh, next is to solve the second layer. Um, here I've actually flipped the cube over. Um, this is in preparation for the next step, but the first layer would be on the bottom, the second layer is in the middle. Uh, notice how the yellow cube is in the center on the bottom. Next, we're gonna solve for a yellow cross. Um, we'll put the edges into place. You'll notice that this is closely mirroring what we did uh, in the original, um, or in the first couple of steps. Um, now we're gonna put the corners into position. So this is called orienting the corners. Um, so they're roughly where they need to be, but they're not actually solved. And finally, we solve for the yellow corners. Uh, so we've got a solved cube. Uh, this seems pretty good, right? We've broken it down into smaller pieces. Um, it's a pretty straightforward way of doing things. Uh, but remember that each step is a different permutation of the cube. Were I a computer solving this, I would have to compute what moves are required to go from point A to point B in the most optimal solution, and I'd have to do that for all seven steps. Uh, to illustrate this, I have a small demo. Demo, all right. Sure, I've got this now, okay. All right, so this is the Rubik's Cube Web 5000. Um, so we're gonna generate a random cube and it's gonna come back really, really fast. Uh, this is a very naive implementation of this algorithm. Um, you can see that it, it came back with 79 moves. It's not too bad. Some of these are whole cube rotations. It's a little bit inflated. Um, so this is just to solve the first layer though. So we'll go ahead and let that run. Uh, so you'll notice uh, with the whites, it's actually doing it in a slightly different order than I talked through. Um, it's gonna be solving the white corners first and then it's gonna be solving the white edges. Uh, it's just a slightly different order of performing the same algorithm. I hope that did not work. 
So I have the wrong thing going here. One sec. Oh, that's what's wrong. That's what happened. Oops. Try that again. Okay, that's better. Hmm. All right, well, sorry. <laughs> um, Uh, so we'll go back to having it compute the entire um, cube solution. Part of this is the um, this library I'm using uh, to visualize the cube is a project called RoofPig. Um, it was it's a pretty cool visualization, uh, but it's a little finicky on how the solution string comes back. It'll actually change the sticker colors around. So this should actually be the full cube solution. If it doesn't spin. All right, I'm gonna punt on this one. We'll come back to this when we switch over to Kosyamba's algorithm. Okay. All right, sorry about that. So, Kosyamba's algorithm was created by Herbert Kosyamba, a German mathematician that you may remember was a member of the team that helped discover that Gauss number was 20. Um, his algorithm is made up of two phases. The first phase solves the cube into a known state. Uh, this allows the second phase to have a considerably smaller subset of moves required to do the final solving. Um, just as an example, we'll use um, the first two layers uh, solution to solve the cube into a given state. So in this instance, the first phase finds uh, the solution to the first two layers. The second phase solves the rest of the cube. So in our problem set, we're looking for the most optimal solution of solving the first two layers. And from there, we're looking for the most optimal solution to solve the remaining layer. Contrast that to the layer by layer solution that we were just looking at, which theoretically worked. Um, and you can see that you know if God's number is 20, then phase one plus phase two should equal a maximum of 20. But even with the, uh, the minor moves we were getting back, we were well above 20. All right, so in order to solve this, we should probably use a tree, uh, more specifically a game tree. Uh, what's a game tree, you might ask. Uh, if there's anybody who's new to programming, you may not be familiar with trees at all. So let's go over a small example. Um, okay, good. Uh, this is a game tree for tic-tac-toe. So as you can see, the initial state of the tree is the initial state of the game, an empty board. That is the root of the tree. Uh, each additional depth of the tree, or each level down, has leaves. Those are connected to a node above them. Uh, those represent a new state in the game. Each edge or line that connects each leaf corresponds to a move in the game. And then each level of the tree is considered an additional depth. The idea is to search the tree until you find a winning state. There are two general ways of performing this search, breadth first search and depth first search. Breadth first search searches across the tree. So it'll search at depth zero, then it'll search at depth one, going from left to right, depth two, going from left to right, etc. cetera. Uh, as you can see that as the tree is iterated, each leaf is checked for the finished solution. If you find that solution, you're done. You don't have to go any further. Um, the other thing that we have here is depth first search. So depth first search means you go all the way down the tree on the left hand side as far as you can go. Then you start coming back up, go back down, come back up. So you can see that you're going uh, up and down and then you're moving left to right. 
Um, so the problem with the game tree is that usually all possible permutations of a game are impossible or highly difficult to build into a tree. Tic-tac-toe, you can probably pretty easily do. You can't put 43 uh, quintillion different combinations into a tree in memory. So we need to make some sort of heuristic to make our search more efficient. Uh, one way to do that is to limit the depth of the search. We know that God's number specifies that all cubes can be solved in a minimum of 20 moves. We can then set our search to be 20 and limit how deep we have to go into the tree. Another problem with the gaming tree as we have it set up is that you have to make a trade-off between how close to solve the Rubik's cube is. For example, if all you did was perform one turn on the cube, you'd expect that solution to be at depth one on the tree. However, if you do a depth first search, it's possible you'll be waiting quite a long time in the comparison, uh, uh, in comparison to be doing a depth or breadth first search. It'd be great if we can minimize that trade off. So if we did a breadth first search, we would hit the solution move on the fifth uh, leaf that's iterated here. But if we're doing a depth first search, we have to go all the way down and up and down as we go across, and you just have to wait longer. And extrapolate that out into the Rubik's Cube problem set, and it's a big difference in time. Uh, we can use a technique called iterative deepening in order to try and hybridize the difference between depth and breadth first search. We'll continue to use the first two layers as an example. So let's say that it requires 15 moves to solve the phase one portion of the algorithm, and then it solves 11 moves to solve the last layer. <clears throat> that is 26 moves in total. Iterative deepening essentially allows us to use less optimal solutions for phase one and check to see if we can generate a shorter phase two. So let's take a look at this. So you can see the first row of the table is our optimal 15 moves for phase one and then the 11 moves for the remainder of phase two for 26 total moves. Then we check, well, maybe 16 moves in phase one generates a shorter phase two, maybe 17, 18, 19, et cetera, until we hit 26 total moves in phase one and zero in phase two. However, hopefully somewhere along the way, we find a shorter total. So in this instance, for 17 phase one moves, and we get six phase two moves for a total of 23. That is an overall more optimal solution. When that happens, we restart our search with the new total of 23. Eventually, we're gonna get to the point where we can't find a more optimal solution. Maybe our algorithm times out, maybe we run out of depth to search in the tree, whatever. At that point, phase one will be the full total move, so the bottom row in the table, and phase two will be zero. Uh, in practice, normally, when you start getting close to this bound, the last few moves that phase one encompasses are actually the first couple of moves that you would actually find in phase two. All right, so how does this all relate to Kosciembo's two-phase algorithm? So instead of using F2L, or the first two layers as its initial state, <clears throat> as its phase one initial state, Kosciembo solves the cube into a known state G1. Uh, the properties of G1 mean that all corners and edges are oriented and all middle layer edges are already in the middle layer. All right, so kind of what does that mean in English? Uh, so, like I said, corners and edges are oriented, so they are roughly in position to where they need to be at a solved state. Um, middle, edge, middle layer edges are already in the middle layer, meaning that if they're going to end up in the middle layer or the second layer down from the top, uh, they need to already be there, but maybe not necessarily on the side that they're, they're going to end up on. <clears throat> the idea around solving to this state is that from here, only a small subset of moves are required to finish solving the cube. So from state G1, you can see that only the moves U, D, R2, F2, L2, and B2 will be required to actually move the cube into the solved state. Uh, this cube is not a cube in state G1. This is just a representation of different uh, edges, corners that are oriented. All right, hopefully this time we're a little more lucky. So we'll be using Kosciembo's algorithm this time. Um, I'm setting it to search to a depth of 21, so like one more than God's number. Um, the reason for this is that my implementation of Kosciembo's algorithm right now needs some optimization, and one additional piece of depth dramatically helps um, the amount of uh, time it takes to search. So. Sometimes it takes a little bit. OK. 
Okay, got it back, and we got a 20 move solution. So. Done. So you can see that took 14 seconds to compute. Um, sometimes it's a lot faster, like right there, uh, 21 move solution. Um, longest I've seen thus far from my implementation is 45 seconds. Um, this one might take a while, let's see. Eh, not bad. All right. Uh, all right, so this is kind of the next steps in the project. Uh, so I based the initial implementation off of uh, reference Python implementations by a couple of uh, different individuals. One by the initial author of the algorithm uh, who ported his Python implementation was from his Java implementation. Uh, and then the second one was from um, someone named Maxim Soy, who's, uh, he's kind of cool. He, he builds a bunch of different um, cube solving robots online. Um, he's got some novel ideas on different um, robotic mechanics and stuff on most efficient ways of like grabbing and letting go of the cube. Um, I ported the code fairly directly. Uh, I converted to idiomatic Ruby uh, in areas where I thought it would be fairly low risk, um, but in general, uh, it was kind of Python-esque. Like, it kind of looked a bit like that. Um, so, uh, <laughs> uh, my next task is to try and optimize the code for the Ruby interpreter. Um, so one thing that this algorithm makes prolific use of is while loops. Uh, I've got a lot of while trues in there. Um, Rubocop loves to tell me that I need to be using loop instead. However, uh, for my low-level testing, loop is actually slower than using while true. Um, if you remember, loop requires a block, which creates a new variable context every single time. While is just looping right there. Um, so it's very possible that as I uh, optimize this algorithm, it will not end up being idiomatic Ruby. Uh, I intend on writing some kind of benchmark suite to try and see like, what kind of a penalty does idiomatic Ruby actually have in this algorithm. Uh, another thing I'd like to put in place is symmetry detection. If you remember, I talked about that before. Um, basically detecting if I can take a given cube state and then see if it's been rotated or something like that and try and short circuit some of my tree searching. Um, some of the algorithm has like the baseline features in place for that, but it just needs to be further fleshed out. Um, there's also a newer implementation of Cosi in this algorithm called min two phase. Uh, you can see the GitHub link there. Um, it actually will solve the cube into the initial state of uh, more than just G1. It has a couple of initial states and a couple of different ways it prunes the decision tree. Um, I haven't investigated that very deep. I actually found out about it only a couple of days ago, but it'd be kind of neat to see what kind of optimizations I can pull out of that. Um, so one last thing. Um, I definitely mentioned a robot at the beginning of this talk. Um, and I've done actually a lot of initial work on the robot. Um, the bot's functionality can be boiled into three steps. Uh, read the cube state, solve the solution, and then solve the cube. So in this instance, uh, use OpenCV to read the cube state, uh, use Cosiemo's algorithm or some modified version of it to compute the solution, and then translate that move set into motor movements. Uh, so you can see a screenshot here of some of the work I've done to read the facelets into OpenCV. Um, the uh, facelets themselves are being highlighted uh, in their appropriately detected color. Um, there's still some work to do around dynamically compensating for different light lighting conditions and doing some refactoring, uh, but it's working pretty well. Uh, the only thing that I have not gotten working particularly well is that the OpenCV bindings for Ruby do not handle live video streams particularly well. Um, I think I need to drop to something that's C-backed to handle the data structures um, and Translating in and out of Ruby objects is just too slow to do the, um, the video processing in real time for this, at least the way I have it implemented. Um, so the next step is use Cosiemo's algorithm, so, so you already covered that. Uh, and then the last piece is the robot and then translating the movements um, strings into some kind of motor movements. 
Uh, so I've been designing the mechanics of the robot already. Um, on the GitHub repository, there are some STL files. Um, those are the files that you 3D print um, around like the cube gripper and how you mount the gears and stuff like that. Um, eventually, I'm hoping to have a full bill of materials up there and instructions and for people to build their own bot, how to run it, et cetera. Um, I've also started implementing motor functionality. I checked uh, existing projects like the R2 gem um, and it's, they don't really implement stepper motors. Uh, I need fine grained motor control to make sure I'm turning exactly 90 degrees and stuff. Um, and so I'm going to be imp uh, ending up implementing my own um, lighter weight solution. Um, there's already a library up on my GitHub uh, username called um, libmpsse. Um, so this is a USB interf uh, interface to what's called the I2C bus. Uh, it's a, a way for like embedded stuff to talk to each other, like think of it like a mini network, basically. Um, it's a C library that's wrapped by uh, using FFI and it, I built out the constructs to be compatible with the existing I2C gem. Um, so eventually I hope to integrate that into a motor controller or you can just drop it in place um, for existing projects. Instead of using something like a Raspberry Pi, you can just hook up something that Adafruit sells uh, to a USB port in your computer and get the exact same functionality. All right, thanks, that's all I got.